Hello everyone, I'm Jim Farrell with the Arbinger Institute. I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar on joy and the outward mindset, how to build a results focused organization that people love. We're broadcasting live today from the headquarters of an amazing software development firm called Menlo Innovations in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we're joined by the uh, co-founders of, of Menlo, James Goebel, Richard Sheridan, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to share with you why Menlo. We could be broadcasting from anywhere. Why from Menlo Innovations? Well, here's the reason. In our experience, you can transform performance and results in an organization if two things happen. The first is if you shift my, the mindsets within the organization, both individually and collectively, from what we at Arbinger call inward mindset orientation to outward mindset orientation. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is this, is to build in uh, systems and processes in the organization that invite outward mindset working, that sustain it, that, that uh, reward it. And uh, we're at Menlo because they are amazing. I mean, we'll get into some things they do. The processes and systems that they've devised together, and what, what's really cool about this is it's not just these two guys, not just James and Rich. They've involved the whole team, and together collectively, they have figured out what would it look like in our context to engage with an outward mindset. So we're gonna get into some of those specific practices today. I think you'll find them fascinating. We won't have time to, to get into all the things that they're doing here, but over the coming weeks, we'll be sharing additional videos, writing blog posts about a lot of the crazy, really amazing things they're doing that we find so interesting and, and helpful. So before we dive into um, uh, Rich and James, some of the specific practices that you, you're engaged in here, I think it would be helpful and interesting if you give us just a little bit of background on how did Menlo come to be and how, why is it that you value Arbinger so much in your project here? So uh, James and I came together when I was a VP at a public company on the west side of Ann Arbor. Uh, I was frustrated with the results my team was producing. I thought I needed some technical tweaks to the team, teach them a few, uh, few new approaches to software development and so on. Uh, but what I discovered in James as a consultant I brought in to work with me was that he and I were reading many of the same books back in those days, uh, books on organizational design, on teamwork, on management, on process, on systems thinking. And so uh, we were kindred spirits uh, and uh, essentially transformed that public company over about a two-year period to what you'll see uh, in the videos and the discussions we have today. And we might still be doing that to this day had the internet bubble not burst. Mm -hmm. And in 2001, uh, we found ourselves uh, uh, out of work and uh, realized that though in those two years, we had discovered something foundationally important to how to produce what we would call now joy in the world of software design and development, which is a fairly joyless industry, uh, <laughs> which we might dive into a little bit here today. Um, later, we discovered your work. Uh, and it so aligned with our thinking and quite frankly enhanced us. Uh, it gave us a new vocabulary to think about why what we're doing here works so well. Mm. So this idea of outward mindset was um, a little bit mind-blowing for me uh, when I first uh, was introduced to it and now I often tell the world uh, that uh, the books you guys have released to the world are some of the most important I have ever read and I read a lot of books hmm. uh, and I'm sure we'll be able to dig in and discover a lot of the things that uh, um, have connected us so deeply to hmm. the Arbinger approach. Well we're massive fans of yours too so that's uh, it goes both directions. Uh, you know I remember one time Rich you said to me something I, I've never forgotten he said what I found in Arbinger's work is you guys what you've revealed in your work is the operating system of the soul. Yes. Is the way you described it. Absolutely. I, yeah. I just said that to somebody today. Huh. Uh, that, um, you know, and I will tell you, for me personally, it was revealing. Uh, this has affected my personal life. My, my wife says I've become a slightly better husband for <laughs> the work. And that is monumental effort on your part to, uh, uh, to get those words out of her. Uh, but it, uh, as we'll see, uh, there's many things we do here that um, if we do them well, uh, can produce amazing results. Mm -hmm. And what you have discovered in your research and your teachings is, uh, quite frankly, something that we needed 
to help us be an even better version of ourselves. Mm. That's fantastic. That's great. Uh, so, okay, so as I mentioned, um, it's really, in our work, we, we really work two tracks. One is we, we help people to, to shift their mindsets from inward to outward, both individually and collectively, but then also help organizations to institute uh, processes and systems that then reinforce all of that sort of work, which is what you guys are just absolutely mind-blowingly brilliant at around here. Um, so I thought, let's dive into a few of your key practices. I, I mean, we could. There are dozens and dozens, but let's let's dive into a few of them. Uh, and one of them, uh, and and we're actually going to share also some footage that we've that over the last 24 hours that we've filmed and produced uh, to illustrate a few of these as well. The first of them is this, and actually you two, um, and I think this is part of the secret here at Menlo, is that you two model this first aspect, and it's that you everything you do, everyone out here on the factory floor, they're all they're all working in pairs, yep. and that starts with you two. You work. You, you yep. work in partnership, yep. and so I think that is partly, you. yeah, you've instituted systems that, that go to that, but you also are living that way all the time. And I think part of the magic here, you probably wouldn't explain it this way, but partly is the leadership that you're bringing. Uh, not in a boat, you don't boast about it at all, but just you're living this way, and it opens up a space where other people can do the same thing. So um, we've captured some footage. Uh, James and I visited yesterday yeah. about partnering here. Um, at Menlo, and then we talked to uh, to a couple of your people as well, who are partnering actually yesterday and today. So we're going to watch a video. It's about uh, six minutes or so to introduce this uh, this concept of pairing, and then we're going to come back and discuss it uh, a little bit more. As as we look around here, I mean, everything you do as a company is built on pairing. Yes. People are paired up. They're not working alone. Can you talk, that's unique. So imagine you had somebody sitting right next to you the whole time you're doing work. They have the same goal, the same focus. And one of the interesting things that happens is people often ask, well, isn't it boring for the other person because they're watching you work? That's not parent. That's somebody observing. Here it's an active, and if you watch their behaviors, right, they're leaned in, they're, and the keyboard will move back and forth. So imagine that one person drives for a little bit, the other person says, oh no, let me show you something. So they're co collaboratively co-creating something. So they're writing code, for example. They're writing together. code together. Yeah. And they may have several techniques, like I'll write a test, you write a little bit of code back and forth, but ultimately they could be writing an email. They could be trying to solve a problem together. They could be writing an index card. They will do it together and both write their names. Now, the side of impact for us is because two people are talking about it, this means they're building a common mindset about a problem. What are they doing? They're practicing communicating. Now, they're also doing it across from everybody else who's working on the same project. So they're not just pairing, they're pairing at a workstation for a particular project. So they're now taking what's in their head, transmitting it to somebody else who's 18 inches away, and others can overhear it. So if they make a decision together, what's really fascinating is how much other people can actually just let that be background noise until all of a sudden they go, what, you're, what, huh? Uh, what? So Tell in the moment, that, so one of the other pairs now yes. is gonna make an adjustment and because they actually, their projects are connecting. Their, their stuff's connected. They're mm. like, you're gonna delete what? I, I didn't even hear what you said, but my brain said it was important. You're deleting what? And then you repeat, wait, you can't delete that. We need it for X. And because you work with somebody for a week, side by side on the same task, you now know better who they are. You now know better how to communicate. Now, once a week, we trade partners. Now, so, do you do that in the same project? So, for so example, most or, people or are they in the transferring same, in between the same project will mostly change. Okay. At a higher level, what we're going to do is we're also going to change one person out of each project. So it remains one team across multiple projects. Right. So everybody gets to work on every project eventually. So for example, and we'll challenge your guys with a camera. Hey Menlo! Hey, hey. Everybody who's worked on Wilmot, please raise your hand. And so if you look around the room, everybody here that you can see has ultimately worked on that project over there. Hmm. Over the course of several years as you swap in and out. Now that means if this project were to be completed, thank you. <laughs> so that's how we do all company meeting. You just call the meeting. You just call a meeting, we have the meeting, everybody goes right back to work. 
right? But now if that client over there says, we've got to get a whole bunch done and this project successfully completes, what do we do with these people? It's really easy. They stand up, they walk over there, we put more computers around there and they've all worked on it at some point. So Keeley's been here a while. Josh has been here only a couple months. How many partners have you had? Oh, everybody but Keeley and <laughs> uh, that's about it, I think. Really? In nine weeks you've everybody. Yeah, I think How many so. projects have you worked on? Uh, four. So if you were to leave tomorrow and go find a job and now put Menlo on your resume, how much stronger is your resume for the skills that you've added in that short time period and the number of projects you could talk about in their stats? Oh yeah, but totally different. Really? Totally, yeah, testing, uh, different tech stacks, different development methodologies. I mean, it's, it's been, I've learned a lot. Well, how about the whole pairing thing? Because you probably didn't weren't in that environment before. Right, right. So, how different is this, and wh what do you like about it, or the things you don't like about it in comparison? The the only the only real drawback is that I'm more tired at the end of the day. <laughs> I mean, because you're talking, you know, with somebody all day long. So you get home, and, and my wife wants to be brief, and it's kind of like, uh, I've been doing that yeah, already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, there's a real power to carry. I think output is, you know, well, there's more output, and there's. Uh, a strength in not being the sole decision maker for it. Every piece of code we write, every character we type is, is filtered through two people, two people's opinions and views and experience. So you're saying that, okay, so you're, you're getting more done. Uh, you're learning faster, it sounds like, at a faster rate. It's just the one drop is you're tired. Uh, and it's, it's hard, yeah, a little bit tired, but okay. So why hadn't you ever prepared before? Yeah. Uh, different organizations. I, it's, it had never been other organizations I worked for are not nearly as collaborative. Everyone's sort of on their own island, and mm. there's expectations. And if you don't meet those expectations, then you know you find out about it six months down the line, or a year down the line, or here feedback is in real time. And if you're if there's gaps, those gaps are are the, the, the drawn to your attention rather quickly. When outsiders come and look, they the first thing in their culture they see is, ah, this is everybody's got a spy watching them. If you just start pairing people who haven't built relationships oh. and haven't built trust, that's exactly what it's going to feel it like. And they're like, well, this pairing thing is not working for us. Mm. Yes, because you didn't build that outward mindset of where the most important thing you can do is make your partner succeed, or the most important thing this pair can do is make sure that they help this pair succeed. How do we make sure that we all succeed together, regardless of how we individually or as a smaller unit succeed? So look, I find the whole concept of pairing fascinating. It's been amazing to watch it happen out here on the factory floor, which is very open and people always working with each other. There was a question that came in about this, the concept of pairing. Uh, well, let's we'll start with the fact that we reward everybody together. Mm. It's one team, right? It's not very exciting to be the highest scoring player on the team that always loses. Mm. And so for many people to get stuck on, well, if you're not going to focus on who's doing the best job individually, what's going to motivate them to do work? And I tell you what, mm. helping your teammates succeed is terribly motivating for many individuals. I think the other thing too is uh, there's no question we've seen time and time again in organizations that we've been part of and other organizations we have uh, ventured into that a focus on individual performance rewards mm -hmm. usually comes at the expense of the team. Huh. Yep. You think of the typical annual performance review, it pits the, uh, the individual against the performance of the team. Mm -hmm. We're going to pick 7% of our team to exceed expectations and everybody else walks out the door feeling like, uh, you know, I came up short. Uh, there's been some famous studies about the organizations that every year cut the lowest 10% mm -hmm. of their team and, and how that just destroyed their culture inside. Uh, for us, uh, it is far, far less about individual performance and far more about the performance of the team. I see. Now, now that we've answered it that way, let me go exactly the opposite. Okay. It is critical in our team to recognize the people who do the best job. Hmm. But it's not about their performance. The people who are the best performers are the ones who enhance everybody else's performance as uh, much as possible. So if everybody's coming to you for help or you come help them on a regular basis before they recognize they need it, Right? So everybody recognizes the person who contributes the greatest to team success, mm. 
by making sure that they're putting their teammates first. Right? They're enhancing the output of everybody else as opposed to drawing attention to them because they're doing such good work. Hmm. So now, how does that show up uh, then, James? Because, um, because what I've seen here the last couple of days is this incredible initiative taking by all of your team members. And by the way, we could have any of the team members here sitting in these two seats and they would be talking the same way as uh, Rich and James are. Um, so they work really hard. And, and, they, and they, there's this motivation you feel, there's this energy feel, you feel to get in there, as you said, to be helping each other. And you said, and that's really what success around here looks like, is the people who are best at helping other people to be able to succeed. How does the group itself, all, how do these partners, these, these pairings, and, and the collective group, how do they help each other to recognize that and to, and to reach further that direction? So there's a really simple mechanism. Um, what we've done is we've redefined who your boss is. Because in most organizations, who do you tout what you've succeeded at? Mm. Right? To your boss. Well, here your boss is everybody else. And why does that work? What does it mean for them to be the boss? Your promotions are determined by your peers. Huh. It's not a 180 degree feedback that we feed into your boss. Your huh. boss is your peers. And so you decide which of your teammates are going to get promoted. So when you're doing a good job helping everybody else succeed, uh -huh. your peers recognize this. Why? Because you're helping them. And they're going to turn around and reward you by saying, you're an important member of the team. Let's increase your pay and status within the team. I see. Because I feel, I've feel felt helped by you. We've yes. been able to do better work. Because, because for example, let's say that um, let's say we're all pairing. Let's say today you and I are pairing, James. So we're going to have experience. And I, you're going to have experience with me. Was, was I helpful to you? Was I making right. your job easier or harder? Right. Did we get to a better result or a worse because we were together? Tomorrow I might be with you, Rich, or next week. <clears throat> Same thing. So we're getting that intelligence on one another. Or we're, we might even recognize when we're pairing together, uh -huh. Rich goes out of his way to make sure that you and I are succeeding. I see. And so it's not even necessarily he was assigned to do that today. But he was seated near us, uh -huh. and he saw there was a time where you and I, I were see. stuck, yeah. and he just intervened to help. So, okay, so you two here, um, uh, you're the co-founders of the organization. You're the quote-unquote leaders of the organization at the top, but you're not the ones making the decisions on who's being elevated no. and all of that. The group, as a peer group, they're all determining that. Well, you can, so imagine, you can imagine a paired work environment. What data would James and I possibly have about members of this team that your peer partner wouldn't have more information? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I think this, again, goes back to outward mindset. Mm -hmm. If when I sit down with you as a peer partner, my job is to help you succeed, to help teach you how to be a better person next week mm -hmm. uh, for your next peer partner, or if I see you struggling with your current pair partner, that I'm willing to come and help the two of you, or perhaps me and my pair partner come and help the two of you. Always keeping ourselves in that outward mindset means the whole team is going to succeed. Huh. You know, the fact of the matter is that uh, huh. most organizations today, whether in software or others, are in a world of high complexity. Very seldom can an individual hero accomplish what our teams need to mm. accomplish anymore. This is really, how do we get to true teamwork? And in our view, our teamwork can't happen unless there is this kind of deep collaboration and trust among the team I members. See. Yeah, okay. And I've seen it. I mean, it's been inspiring, for sure. Um, for sure. In fact, I want to get more into the sort of the peer group, not just as in pairs, but as a whole mass group, some of the things they're doing together here around onboarding, for example, in a moment. Um, I have a question though. So um, let's say I'm a potential client of yours. And so we, you know, we have some initial talks and then I learn about your process and I learn from you, Rich, you tell me, so Jim, we're gonna have two people working on each computer. Yep. And I say, oh, okay, wait a sec. So you're billing me for the, the single computer, right? No, 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 you're actually getting billed for both people. Yep. Now, so my initial reaction might be, that's gonna cost me twice as much money. Sure. Yep. So do you hear that? Of course. And if so, what's your response? Is it true? I mean, what's your experience around all of that? Yeah, a lot of people like you come in, they see us, they're fascinated with what we've accomplished. They're actually excited about it. They, they see the human energy in the room, they can sense the pace of the team and so on. And then, then they put on their CFO hat <laughs> and they look and they're like, oh, this is really cool, but do I have to pay for both of those people? I say, absolutely you do. And of course, now we get to the meat of the discussion. 
why on earth would I want to pay two people to do what seems like we could just cleave them in two and have them do twice as much work? If, and I think this is true in most professions, but let's just look at software development. Software development has never, ever, in its history, been a typing speed contest. It's not about how fast can I click the keys on the keyboard. It's how fast can I solve a problem and have it solved in a way that actually lasts that actually is complete enough that it could be delivered to the world. And quite frankly, we know, just anecdotally, you know, our little phrases of life where two heads are better than one. Two people are always faster at solving problems together than one person working individually. If you consider the long-term cost of what does it take for this solution to survive the contact with the real world. Mm. And so you type something, and in that moment, I see something. I ask you something. I, I say, hey, Jim, where are you going with this? And, and suddenly it wakes you up out of some yeah. you know, confidence, at the very least, where you thought you were going in the right direction. And you look and say, oh, my gosh, Rich, you're right. Mm. You're right. I was going in the wrong direction. That was really good to catch that. And I said, Jim, I didn't catch anything. I just asked you where you were going, what you were thinking. Huh. But us challenging each other. Uh -huh. You know, you think about how many times we are stuck in the normal activities of any business day where I, I have an idea, I start moving forward, then I get stuck. Sometimes stuck is just sitting there contemplating. Sometimes stuck is, man, I'm typing away. Mm -hmm. Those two kinds of stuck, though, your pair partner is there to unstick you, to challenge you, to uh, perhaps say, I got it. I can take it from here. It's one of the reasons a team reports they go home tired at the end of a day. Mm -hmm because they've been working the entire day. Now, one of my favorite stories is Keely, who uh, was getting texts right after she joined here out of college. And uh, they were saying, Keely, are you mad at us? She said, no, why? I said, oh, well, you're not answering our emails, our phone calls, our text <laughs> messages, and so on. She goes, oh, I'm working. He said, oh, we're working too, but we can do all that stuff while we're working. Her huh. answer I thought was pretty precious. She said, I can't. I'd be letting my pair partner down. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. She didn't say, I can't, somebody's here watching right, me. Right, right. I can't, I'm in a big open yeah. room, Richard James might see me. She felt a personal responsibility to the productivity of the person sitting wow. next to her. Whereas, okay, so what percentage of the time are the friends actually devoting not to work at right. all when they're at work? That's oh, the yeah. question, right? Yeah. Most, yeah. most executives, when they hear me tell that story, it dawns on them, okay, right there you've picked up 50% of productivity. Yeah, right. But our evidence says this is 10 times as productive. Really? Yes. We have direct evidence, direct data that says this is 10 times as productive. Huh. Because, again, where are we measuring? If it's typing speed, yeah, it's twice as slow. Mm. It's never been about typing speed. I see. That's, that's, that's super interesting. You know, that leads into a, a second practice, which I find fascinating what you're doing here. And that's how you onboard people. Mm -hmm. um, because your whole culture, your whole work process is built around working together in this sort of paired sort of way. So you figure out a way to, to devise an interviewing process that, that assesses people doing that. And, and you don't even ask any questions. There are no questions to your interviewing process. None. You don't even look at resumes. You don't look at resumes. <laughs> So let's, we, we shot a little video on this as well. Let's watch this uh, little clip and then let's come back and talk more about it. It's, it fascinates me. If you think just about how we interview, our first interview process, we bring massive people in. We pair them during the interview because we work in pairs. So we simulate the work environment during the interview and we begin teaching our culture the moment of that first interview. We tell the person, each individual person, their job is to make their partner look good. So right away in the interview, we're already teaching people about an outward mindset to another human being. Don't worry about the fact that the person sitting next to you is actually applying for the same position you are. Help them succeed. And in doing that, you will be demonstrating your ability to succeed in an environment we've created here. How do people receive that when you say that? Because I think that their just brains just twist in the wind. <laughs> Because you can imagine, if you tell somebody you're in an interview, you're paired with another candidate, and your job is to make your partner look good, your job is to help your partner get a second interview. Of course, their first initial reaction is, but wait, I want the second interview. 
And we look at them, we tell them, we even, we diffuse that a little bit by saying, we understand what's going through your mind right now. But understand, we're good at looking for this because there's a Menlonian sitting across from you who's watching how you behave towards your pair partner. And they're asking themselves a simple question. Will they help me look good? Will they help support me when I'm struggling? So it's a very personal interaction, but it's all focused in this idea of helping others. First, helping others in the room, and then helping others succeed in the world. Imagine if everybody at work, their first mission was to make sure everybody else at work succeeded. How would that change the dynamic? And that's really hard for people to imagine because they get stuck in this idea of there's no reciprocity, right? If I do that, who, how will I get my job done? At Menlo, we're trying to change that. It's not my job, it's our job. So what do I need to do to make sure we can do the best job possible? And that's what we're looking for in the interview. We're creating a circumstance for two people to work together. Now what immediately happens is there are people who focus on themselves, but it very quickly becomes quite clear when you've given the instruction, how many people can then focus on this pair partner? How can I make this other person success? And so many people are actually wired to want to do that that they don't even worry. You can see it. At the end of the interview, they actually care about this other person who wants the same job. They don't think of it as competing with anymore. Those are the people we want on the team. It's brilliant. It's, I mean, it's inspiring, it's brilliant, I love that. Um, We've actually had people during an interview process afterwards give us feedback and they say, I don't even care if I get the job. The interview alone has changed my life. Because maybe for the first time in a work context, they actually saw what true teamwork looks like. Okay, so now I want to dive into this interviewing process of yours. And actually, you're in the middle of it today. You have two people out here working in a pair for one day, right? Which is which is sort of the second interview. Correct. So let's let me um, let me quickly describe what I understand to be the sort of the sort of the high level process, and then why don't you dive in and walk us through the nuances of it? So, so every so often, I don't know what the cadence is. Every month, every couple months, you'll have what's called an extreme interviewing event where there might be thirty to fifty people who will gather, right? Yep. And it'll be for two hours. They're going to get a little bit of a uh, introduction about Menlo and what you're about and what this process is going to look like. And then what you're going to do, if I'm one of these people, is you're going to pair me up three times with, mm -hmm. with, with uh, other candidates yeah. who are all vying for the same positions. Yeah. This is where you were just talking about, there the two of you, that then the instruction is, your job, Jim, is to help your pair partner get to the second interview. Uh, right. And that's this whole, like, wow, that's amazing. I mean, the outward mindset nature of that, get people's minds off of just themselves and know how are we going to help others to succeed. So then... Then what's happening is you've got Menlo people who are observing each of these par pairings. And then after that two hours, the Menlo folks have stayed after work. These are the peers who own the process. Yep. Yes. And they're then they're discussing each person in turn and deciding who would we want to pair with, you know, and who would be a good fit. And so then those folks are invited back to quote unquote the second interview. Is this right? And that second interview is a one day contract to work yes. yep. with a pair. And then there's another, I think at the end of that day, in fact, we witnessed this yesterday, there was someone in here yesterday, and all the folks who sort of observed that person and paired with them, they had a debriefing at the end of the day, again, after work hours on their own time, um, figuring out, okay, is this someone we want to bring to the second interview, which my understanding is, what, three-week contract? Yep. Yes. And then they, so you get a lot of pairing. So by that time, there've been no interviewing questions traditionally, none of that. All you've done is been working together. You see how well you work together, what that's like. Um, and then somehow you decide whether you're gonna offer that. I'm, I'm sure that's the peers again getting together and deciding, are we gonna bring them on board? Now, that is, um, that's so cool. Talk about that more. So that's sort of the high level stuff. What has that brought to you? I mean, what, how did this even come about that you started interviewing this way? Well, let's start with a really simple assumption, right? The questions you ask a candidate, you're designing those hopefully to predict their future performance. Mm -hmm. And how well those predict their performance might have some income or uh, some ability to deal with the outcome. Yeah. What if instead you just skip to whether or not they can do the work? Mm -hmm. Right? So what if we just put them in the situation where they do the work and now we can evaluate whether they're doing the work without using this intermediate measure? I see. It has to be the situation of the work as you do it here at Menlo, right. right? It has Correct. to be this kind of work. Yeah. Right. Someone right. else's workplace might look different. It would be, for them, it would be immersed in their kind of work. Right. And okay. we're doing yeah. it in our work style. Okay. Right? Uh -huh. We're teaching not only our cultural mindset, mm -hmm. which is this outward mindset of help your peer partners succeed, 
but we're doing it in the context of our actual practices. Mm. So imagine you got to the point of onboarding is interviewing. Uh, you know, most organizations totally fail at onboarding new people, mm. right? I get you really excited during the interview, and then I kind of leave you rotting at the back <laughs> deck of the, <laughs> right. uh, you know, the loading dock when you arrive because we don't have a cube, an office, a chair, a table, a computer, an email address, yeah. a business card, and you know, you're going to take weeks before you start to get acclimated. Here, it starts happening essentially minutes into mm. that second interview of that one-day trial, you're doing real work, real projects. Paired with a peer, you're going to be working with over and over again if you succeed here. And so we're not just simulating the work environment, it is the work hmm. environment. So we're, okay, we're also ahead, giving the candidate a really interesting opportunity to feel what it like it's like uh, to work here. They might not they like it. it. Yes. yes. Imagine yep. if you could discover right. that before you start the job. Uh-huh. Before you turn down the other opportunity, right. for example. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, huge. people who watch this webinar, I want to work there. And then they come and they spend a day and they're like, oh, where's my <laughs> private cube? This is, this is really, you know, uh, yeah. uh, you know uh, tiring. Uh, you know, I want my, I, wa I need to escape. I need my earbuds in. All those things don't happen here. And so we want to expose you to that right off the bat. Yeah. Okay. Makes great sense. So yesterday we had a, a bit of a discussion where I observed uh, as we were thinking and talking about this onboarding process that this is a way you've discovered to basically select for an outward mindset. It's one of the things you're, as, the, as your Menlo, uh, Menlonians, as you call them, are, are observing all these candidates, they're selecting for, is this a person who works well with other people? Do they care about helping other people? So you're selecting for an outward mindset. And you took that idea deeper, actually, than just that. Can you well, speak to that? Our, our th thought is that I'm going to just use my optimistic side of me and believe that I think most of us are wired for that outward mindset. Hmm. Our normal business culture systems that focus on individual rewards and individual performance achievement say, my job is to try and get ahead of everybody else. Right. And so we quickly take that outward mindset we would normally be wired with, put it away in a box when we leave home, come into work and not use it at all. Here, what they're learning is you can keep that part of yourself right here at work. You can bring it in. So, yeah, I think we are selecting, but I also think we're teaching. I think we're exposing. We're giving them a chance to perhaps bring a different version of themselves to work that they've ever had a chance to do before, and uh, and that allows people to blossom in a way they've never huh. ever had a chance to do, even huh. if they thought it was the right thing to do. Very quickly, the cultural system they were inside of said, oh, don't do that here. Right. Don't do that at work. Yeah. You can do that in a t-ball team that you're leading or, uh, you know, some uh, school function that you're involved with your kids or something like that. But for goodness sakes, don't bring that version of you to work. It's also an important opportunity for our team to reflect, right? So we gather as a group ah. to observe the large team. When an individual comes for the one day, many people get to work with them and then we meet at the end of the day and compare our notes about the desired behaviors. We've given the candidate the hint, can they show us? And we coach them, right? Their teammates that are pairing with them are actually trying to help them succeed right. at the interview. The it's not objective. a trick. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. We're not trying to make you fail, which uh -huh. is the tone of many interviews. Hmm. Instead, in the interview, we're trying to help you succeed. When our team is then reflecting on how a candidate performed, it's really also an opportunity to reflect on how they've been performing over the upcoming weeks and saying, am I being a good teammate, right? It really reinforces some of our internal messaging for each other, and it's not the bosses doing it, it's the team members saying, who do I want to work with? Gee, who am I supposed to be to my teammates? I see. So the onboarding process is actually about the whole existing team as well. I mean, they're re-upping yes. into the culture Absolutely. as they're participating in the process and helping others to join. And, and an opportunity for self-reflection where they might be, oh yeah, that negative behavior I saw in that candidate, I did that three times today. Uh huh. Right, and, and it causes you to self-reflect and say, I could be a better team member. I see. Yeah, I do that very same thing. Okay, yep. I've got to get better there. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, that's terrific. We go on and on. We can spend hours yes. on that. By the way, uh, you can come actually take tours at Menlo. Tons of people do. Um, they have they have people that devote their time for they call it the, the for to the experience That's right true. the Menlo experience and actually all the team members yesterday there was a tour came through while we were we, we were here and two of their one of your project manager or no wait one of your uh, quality assurance people 
Mm-hmm. And then I think it was one of your developers, Correct. two of them, yep. took, took people for an hour or two around this tour. And I actually followed that tour. It was marvelous. It's fantastic. So I said, they could be sitting here as well. We've been having the same conversation. Yeah, everybody on the team knows that they, they, are, yeah. they are potential candidates for leading tours. Yeah. And they all lead the culture in the same way. All of them are all pulling together. It's, it's fun to see. Well, okay, let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, one more of, of your very interesting practices among tons. And as I mentioned, we'll, you know, we'll have videos in the coming weeks about additional things that happen here in Menlo and write about them as well. Let's talk about one more and then let's dive into some questions. I understand there's tons of questions that have been coming from all of you, so thank you. Um, so uh, one of your concepts here is, and I don't know when this started, uh, but you, you decided, well, it was probably clear to you that we've got to understand what customers want and need. But sometimes the customers didn't, don't even know what they want and need. How are we going to figure out what's actually needed? And so there was a, there was a need to get um, really good at uh, observing and learning the basic humanity of people and how they function in, in their work environments. And you call that high-tech anthropology, as I Correct. understand. Um, so let's, let's watch a little video clip about that practice here at Menlo, and then we'll talk about it. Earlier, you and Rich were talking about the whole project of bringing joy requires you to look outward, right, with an outward mindset, and 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 first and foremost, look outward toward the people you're trying to serve. So, can you talk about how you do that here? Um, I know there have been a whole bunch of key moves you've made strategically as an organization. Uh, I'd be really interested in hearing what it is you've been doing. So one of the most expensive things you can do in software is build the wrong solution. Yeah. And all too often people have this idea in their head, I've got this great idea. And their great idea, while it's great, might ultimately not work for the end users. And so what we have is what we call high-tech anthropology. We take a couple of our team members, their job is to go out into the world and understand the customer's perspective, right? So really look outward instead of inward. Instead of the inner expert and their ideas, go study the users. Not just ask the users what do they want, but watch their behaviors for critical tells. Mm -hmm. So if we go ask somebody, what would you like in a diagnostic device for a diesel truck? They're gonna give us their, their thoughts that they have. The reality is if we hand them a fictional device that we make out of duct tape and there's weights in this and we hand it to them we can immediately start to see how they behave do they hold it sideways do they hold it here do they put their hand in the strap then what we do is we take and we make software potentially live by creating screens that are done with hand-drawn data and again what we do is we're going to watch how they behave with something so the high-tech anthropologist's job is to go out watch what users do People come to us and will say, typically humans describe a problem by doing what? They tell you the solution. So first thing we do is dive in and try to figure out what the real problem is. You know, what's the root? So you're constantly, you know, digging down because as human beings, we're wonderfully fallible about kind of jumping to conclusions and going, this will solve the problem, <laughs> right? And, and oftentimes that's, you know, that's just the surface. So. So this particular project is to help lawyers. They will go watch people doing work in a law office. Then they'll write that's, up descriptions. That exciting. Well, it, <laughs> it, again, back to the outward mindset. Yeah. If you're looking for them to entertain you, uh, then it's not very entertaining. Yeah. If you're there excited about learning about somebody else's daily life uh -huh. and understanding what their pains mm -hmm. are and helping them become aware of those pains, then that's as alive as anything else. Then, Absolutely, yeah. because you get to discover a whole new world that you didn't understand yeah. before. We practice in, in Zen, it's called the beginner's mind. So you walk into a situation and you have to really disabuse yourself of any preconceived notions. So you don't watch somebody do their job and go, that doesn't look very efficient. You really have to see it from the empathetic perspective of the person doing the, the job. It is very humbling to spend a lot of time in people's workplaces. It's amazing the obstacles they overcome to do their jobs. It's, it is astounding. How do you know when you're starting to get close to it, to what the real problems are? Ah, oh, that's a really good question. We really look for the pain. 
So when you find the pain in an organization or you find the pain when you're observing someone doing their job, you know, it's at that point where they turn around and go, did you, how many times does that happen, right? Once we get to the end of a lot of interviews, I think it's probably a lot of unconsciously realizing all these things are aligning in this pattern of pain. And so here's where the problem that we need to focus on is. So I've heard both of you talk about this, that this, this aspect of your work, this high-tech mm -hmm. uh, anthropology, is critically important. Can yeah. you talk to that why, help us understand why it's at the heart of what you do? Any organization that talks about its purpose um, could look at profits and shareholder return and uh, all the things that uh, you know they might talk about in an MBA program at a business school. When we think about the purpose of this organization, our purpose is to delight the people we intend to serve, which will be the people one day using the work that happens in this room and the hearts and the hands and the minds of this team produce and craft some piece of software, put it out in the world. What we're thinking about first and foremost is who do we serve? Who's going to be using that to perform their jobs every single day? And for us, when we delight them, when we delight the people who one day use everything that's happening in this room, that is, in fact, our definition of joy here mm -hmm. at Menlo. When people report back to us, uh, find us, figure out that we're the ones that develop software they use every day, and they tell us we made their lives better because of the work that happened in this room, that is joy for us. And so our purpose, our focus of attention, external to the organization, is focused on producing delight in the people we intend to serve. We can't do that sitting in a whiteboarded conference room. We have to get out of the building. We have to get out into the world. We have to study the people we intend to serve and study them in their native environment. And through observation rather than interview, learn. Why observation rather than interview? Look, everybody self-reports incorrectly. I see. Right? Uh, we, we, we think we will, we will be polite. Oh, this is great. I love this. When will this be available? Oh, you guys did such a good job. Wonderful. Are you going to use it? Oh, absolutely. We just go out and watch them. Do they, do they respond? Does it make, do we see the pains falling away that we had earlier identified? And when we, when we start seeing that happen, when, when all of a sudden people are like, how soon will this be available? I, I, I need this right now, don't leave. Uh, and then when sales of those products and services that our customers are bringing to the world start taking off, again, that's, that's joy for us, I say. So you can look at this as an outward mindset on product development, product design. Mm -hmm. But there's an interesting complexity to this. Right? So if Rich were a high-tech anthropologist, he's trying to understand the end user. But in reality, end users don't hire us. You as a product manager inside of a company will come to us. Now the instinct of so many people is when we're doing design work, they want to please you. I see. Because I'm paying for your you're work. You're paying for the work. Yeah. You're the person who's going to say good things to us while yeah. we're here. An interesting challenge for our high-tech anthropologists is they have to help you get to an outward mindset about something you are already believe you're an expert at something that you've already got a fixed idea they're going to go out into the world and then try and help you see the Turn world outward. in a new way yes yeah so they're agents you're a high-tech anthropologist actually are agents for turning the world outward i mean the yes. world you're working in actually absolutely they're helping your clients to do that that's fascinating simple yeah. example that probably everybody can relate to if you think about a life insurance company that sells life insurance policies and ask them who they serve mm -hmm. they might say well our policyholders are who we serve I don't think so. I think the people they actually serve are the beneficiaries of the policies that are sold. Uh, Those folks, you're never going to make contact with, hopefully for 10 or 20 or 50 uh, years from now, and they aren't your customers. They're people who will interact with you once and are expecting tremendous compassion and empathy uh, and organization and, and delivery at the moment of their greatest need in their lives. Mm. And I think if we start as organizations, whatever kind of company you are, if you start thinking all the way through the value chain, who do we serve? It may well not be the people who pay you yeah. for what you do. Yeah. But I will tell you, when you focus mm. your attention on that, 
it energizes them. It energizes a team to say, Them being, you're talking about your developers, your whole team. Right. Because they recognize this isn't about, oh, am I helping enrich Rich and James? Are, are our shareholders happy? Are we? None of that inspires Even as our people. client happy in the moment, right? Uh -huh. How are we helping our client in the long term? How are we helping them succeed with their mission? Which means we have to help them see outside into the world I see. and see their customers and possibly the value chain even further. Uh -huh. We talk here about ending human suffering in the world as it relates to technology. <laughs> I love that. What's interesting is the number of customers who show up here who themselves are trying to end some kind of human suffering in the world and they find us because of the alignment of what they're trying to do in the world and what we've already decided we want to do uh, for the world. Um, I know we have a ton of questions. Are there a question of two we, that we could take on? Great, Rich. James, well, I, let that? me just first say, this is the reason, Jim, you and we are together today. Mm -hmm. Because when I read the Leadership and Self-Deception book, The Anatomy of Peace and later The Outward Mindset, to me, this was this peak inside of the operating system of the soul. Because you can imagine how important it is in our environment to not avoid interpersonal conflict, but do it in a way where we're both constructively looking at the mm. conflict outside of ourselves. Yeah. Right? This isn't about you offended me, I don't like your idea, or you didn't like my idea. It was like, are we coming up with the best solution? If we can begin focusing ourselves away from ourselves and mm. out to the problem we're trying to solve, we're gonna we're gonna create a better team. They're gonna feel better about their work life, they're gonna feel probably better about their entire life because this is where they're de deriving a lot of their purpose. So you're saying, so conflict will come up when we get inward worrying about this, my thing that, that I'm not getting done the way I think it should yep. be done, and your thing, you, we're all, and we're, we get in conflict, we butt heads that way. Whereas, no, if we can stay aligned outwardly together, and, and let's say you and I, Rich, are working in a pair, it's not about us, it's not right. about me, it's not about you, it's about who are we doing this for? Yep, we've watched of, and, and team members delightfully yeah. just argue, uh, you would passionately argue at a whiteboard with one another, and as soon as noon comes, they're like, hey, you want to go out to lunch? <laughs> and we're, we even marvel at it to see that they can just drop it because... So, so we want positive conflict. Con I right? say conflict. differences of opinion are yes. important. Right. You need, yeah, okay. Absolutely. That's we don't want harmony. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if, if, ever, if we're always in harmony, then one or the other of us probably isn't producing any value. I see. But we want to fight about the product. We want to fight about what we're trying to achieve. We don't want to fight each other. Yeah, right? right. When it becomes personal, then it's usually, right, that inward facing. And it does become personal. These are regular human yeah, beings. Yeah, humans. Under. This is why we look for books like yours mm -hmm. to uh, teach us how do we become better people? How do we become better at interacting? Heck, I got trapped in one of these this morning, and the team brought me aside. We talked it through, and it mm. was delightful by the time we got done. So mm. we're all susceptible. Mm. Every one of us as humans is susceptible to this, and uh, and this is why so much of this is so important to us. And, and uh, the simple formula for us getting to trust, mm -hmm. okay, as leaders, one of our jobs, pump as much fear out of the room as we can. Let's not motivate with fear. Now, there's things we should be afraid of. Right? I mean, we don't walk out into streets without looking both ways, that sort of thing. Yeah. But if James and I decided as leaders we're going to motivate this team through fear, mm. we've already lost the battle. But if mm. we can pump enough fear, people will begin to feel safe in this environment. Fear does a great thing about sharpening your decision making. You now decide fight or flee. I see. Yep. Right? Yeah. It's not very productive it, for getting Both of those options are about myself. Yes. Yep. Right? Yeah. And they're keeping us in that non human part of our brain. Yeah. Right? But if, if we feel safe, I then see. we will begin to collaborate with one another. Mm -hmm. Trust will begin to develop, teamwork will emerge, and then if we keep ourselves in that most human part of our brain, we will get to the things that make us the most mm. human. Creativity, imagination, invention, innovation. Mm. That's what every team mm. on the planet's looking yeah, for. Yeah, for right sure. Now. You know, it, it strikes me that uh, a lot of times, a person could get in conflict with another because they, they hardly interact. And so we make up in our own minds things oh, yeah. about what the other person is thinking. Yep. In your culture, the way you've set up your system here, 
you don't have the same kind of opportunity for that because that person that I might be making, I'm, I'm working with them next yeah. week, yeah. right? Yeah. We're, we're ne for a week long, we might be paired up. And then I realize, oh no, this is just a person working yep. hard and we might have some differences. But th it's a humanizing process every step of the way, it seems like, because you're, it's not that you're, you're not forcing anyone to do that. It's just the way your system's set up is they're going to engage with each other. Well, if we just force people together who are having conflict, that can just intensify the conflict. Yeah. The real question is, do they have a common purpose? Mm. So if you and I are going to work together on something, and together we're focused on that outcome, uh -huh. right? Right. Instead of me focusing on you and me, and we focus on that, and we work elbow to elbow, trying to work outwardly together, yeah. that's really where the opportunity to build trust comes yeah. from, right? Because now we have a common experience, working on a common goal, and we understand a higher purpose as to why the things that make you different from me might be valuable and useful mm. in a way that wasn't working for me when I was just irritated. I see, right, exactly. I realized, wow, that person working with you, James, made my life easier, made the product better Absolutely. as a result because of the differences you brought. That's, that's fantastic. Probably time for one more question and then we'll, we'll sort of put a wrap on this. Well, to get somebody promoted, a team member who says this person is performing higher than their current position assembles the team and says, let's have lunch and talk about it. And if they can build consensus with the peers, they go to uh, the factory floor manager and say this person's supposed to get a raise. They're supposed to get promoted. And it used to be I get an email telling me, and they don't even do that now. Right. They just go to the wall and they move the person's tag and is they go to right? payroll yeah. and they change it. Well, we so have we no don't even say know. it, now this works. Now, yeah. one yeah. of the things that's so interesting to me about because you could imagine, well, wow, we're all just going to get together and we're going to give each other raises. Yep. But the other thing that's happening here, because we were in your meeting yesterday when you did this, I don't know if this happens every Monday or not, yep, but it does. You, you gathered the entire team. The whole company gathered, mm -hmm. and you went over every piece of your finances. Yes. And oh, wait, so, so knows, I'll push back a little bit. Okay. We did this week where I helped lead that. That's not normal. The team leads the team through the finances. I see. We normally yep. may not be there because we're off visiting a client, or we're sitting in I the back. See. They're doing the leading through the finances. I they're see. making the decision. So, so since they're involved in the books, yes. and the, they know the state of the company, they also know if we gave everyone, ra all of us raises, we wouldn't have a company. Uh -huh. Well, they not so only they, know that, they can compute which day will go out of business because they're doing cash I in and see. cash out as part of their tracking. So they <laughs> might be out there deciding what their last day bonus might uh, be. I see. Something. We're going to go out with a bang anyway. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So, so, so in a way, you have an owner's mentality out here, yes. everyone in the shop, because you are entrusting them with all that kind of information that in many cases only owners have and you trust them to be able to think through that and that allows them too to be able to think through things like promotion I'll go to say you couldn't do I'll go beyond that it's more than trust I need them to do that I need them to elevate their performance mm -hmm. to help our clients elevate their performance right and so yeah. it's not that I just trust them and it's a gift of some kind I need them to step up their game and understand how to run a business so that they can help our customers run theirs. Yeah, fantastic. And, and, yeah, and yeah. back to low performers. Mm. If somebody isn't performing well, it's going to be really obvious very quickly. I might be able to fool you for 40 hours. I might be able to fool James for 40 hours. But after a month or six weeks of right. just me working hard to convince you that I'm working hard, Number one, I'm going to be exhausted trying to do that. Number two, I'm going to have four to six people on a team who are like, hey, every time Rich sits down, he folds his arms, he sits back, and he says, hey, show me what you want to do today. Mm. And I'm not performing. That's going to get very tiring for the team. Now, the first thing we want to do is talk to that person, yep. uh -huh. right? Okay. And we have you know, taught each team member, when there's a conflict with another human being on the team, please ask this question first before all others. Are you okay? Hmm. Let's step away from work for a uh, second. Is there something, something that's going on in your life? Yeah, yes. something that's coming I in. See. No, you don't have to share all your personal details. Yeah. But boy, oh boy, if, if I find out that a, a loved one passed away or is sick in the hospital or even buried a pet last week and that just is not... Let's not try and loop. fix your communication style right, right now. now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. right. There's another issue here that's yeah. really... And, you yeah. know, and if you say, no, I'm fine, everything's going good, great. Well, we have some things we need to talk about. Yeah. Because this isn't working. And, mm. you know, and we know it's not working. Do you think it's working? You know, and again, this is why I'm going to go back to your teachings. Uh, this is why the kind of things you talk about in Outward Mindset are so important to us. Because 
it's not about, you know, is my peer working well? Is my, is my colleague working well? Is, is Jim hmm. okay. working well? I see. Are you okay? Yeah, Are yeah. You, not know? a nameless category. Right. But yes. That person over there. Yeah. He's my friend. Right. And my Somebody colleague. I helped to yeah. get into this team. Or, I feel a personal responsibility. I'll, I'll even, let's push that back. Maybe they're not even a friend. Uh, but I care about them. Mm. Right? Because I want the team members, they may not all be friends but they need to care about everybody else who's on the team. And they were all involved in bringing each of the members yes. in anyway. So they, there is an investment in each other's success. They feel a personal responsibility yes. yeah. for the other people. If you if you'd hired the someone said, "Here's the new person." Yep. I'm like you're going to love him. Oh yeah, you're going to love him. Right. So now yes. if I've yep. got issues with you, I might not like them and and then we have when someone needs to be let go, well now we have political issues yep. in the office as well. Here you're saying so when there are performance issues even to the point of letting someone go, yep. actually the team's handling Yep. You don't. It's not that you're walking in and, right. and being the heavy. Nope. They'll they'll That's come in. They'll consult with us. Yeah. They'll ask us for advice. That sort of thing. That's what you should reach out to a leader for. Yeah. And again, this inverts the leadership yeah. pyramid, right? Sure does. Now you feel like it's servant leadership. Mm. How can James and I support the top leaders in the team to make them better at supporting the next layer down? Yeah. Or, or if it's time for somebody to leave, how do we help them find that next position? I see. Yeah. How do we, we make sure really they're taken care of? Yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah. Yeah, we let somebody go not too long ago and, and the team felt really bad about it because they really liked them. Yeah. I said, Great, what do they need right now more than anything else? Yeah. Oh, they need another job. How can we Terrific. help them find it? How can we help them? Huh. Yeah. I have a lot of contacts. Do you know anybody? And all of a sudden they were like, Oh yeah. Yeah, I know somebody's looking for for a huh. position across town. Awesome. Now let's stop thinking about the colleague we just let go. Let's start thinking about as a human being who needs to support their family, pay their house payment. Uh, you know, stop worrying about go. us. Let's worry about them. Yeah, yeah. That's you guys. Okay. Look, don't you feel like you just want to keep talking? Uh, we could go on for hours. Uh, look, you guys. First of all, such a pleasure. Yeah. Seriously, thanks for your time and for devoting this sort of time for all of us and for sharing not only here, but I mean your your whole way. You you'll you'll put tours on for other software companies. Yep. Yep. Uh, you're, everything's an open book because you're wanting the whole world to be different in this way, and that's fantastic. Now, one of the things we've talked about is, you know, they they do some crazy thing. I mean, at least compared to what normally happens out in organizations, you might think that looks nuts. Um, but it works here so well. It doesn't necessarily mean that's the particular system that would be right in your particular context. I mean, there, there are a lot of things to look at in that. And if you guys were going and consulting with companies, they wouldn't necessarily all end up looking like what you're doing. And in our work, when that's what we're doing with organizations, we help them apply outward mindset principles and come up with systems that support that. It might look somewhat like what you're doing in other contexts a little bit different. But the project of doing that thinking and that work, caring enough about people to actually ask the right kinds of questions and then experiment together. Like you said, let's run a little experiment and yep. see what works. That's fantastic. I So look, I want to first thank the both of you and also um, put a plug in. Uh, Rich has written a book called Joy Inc. It's one of my all-time favorites. It's fantastic. If you want to dive into a whole bunch of more specifics um, about what's going on here at Menlo. I hope you found this to be a meaningful hour together um, and that you've, you're leaving not with, oh, that's the quick behavioral fix we're going to do, but rather, oh, wow, if we can figure out in our work environment to care as deeply about the people we're working on behalf of and working with as they're doing here at Menlo, uh, what might be different in our workplaces? That's a question worth, worth asking and worth experimenting with. Okay. Wish you all the luck. Thanks for joining us today.